welcome to Eco Elsa. Welcome back, my returners. And for those of you who are new and don't know me, my name is Elsa, and I make environmental education videos to help you guys get outdoors and learning about wildlife and our environment. In today's video, we are interviewing Katie Krause from Bears Etc. She is the owner and founder, and she's worked in wildlife sanctuaries and rehabilitation places for over 20 years now. So I'm going to let her take over a little bit here and talk about who she is and her background and a little bit more about bears, etc. the place that she's running and got started. As well as we're going to be talking about all your guys' big questions when it comes to sanctuaries, roadside zoos, uh, owning exotic animals, and of course the big old tiger in the room, the Tiger King, who we will be referring to the rest of this video as simply Joe Exotic, or the Tiger Crook because this isn't the person we really want to be supporting in this field, and we'll be explaining more to you guys about that. So, Katie, why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself, more about your background, and about Bears Etc. So, I'm Katie Krause. I'm the Executive Director of Bears Etc., and we leave the world better than we found it by connecting people with nature and giving people and animals a piece of the wild. Uh, the P-E-A-C-E -E that comes with being out in nature and connecting um, with the animals and the plants and you know everything that goes along with that uh, again promoting people to get outside and it helps to then respect our planet when you have those connections and this dream started over 20 years ago I was working at a veterinary hospital as an assistant and he saw exotic and uh, really uh, became a passion of mine because back then oh, about 25 years ago they were coming in really sick and we weren't able to save them. So my goal number one was to educate the public as much as possible about these animals because once they show signs of illness as a wild animal, they were really sick and really hard to save because if you show that you're sick in the wild, you're going to be preyed upon, right? And so then um, one day this bird came in with this lady and she had a facility, a backyard menagerie or a roadside zoo, as we like to call it. And she invited me to come there and she had tiger cubs and baby monkeys and stuff like that, that I then helped raise as I started volunteering there on my days off from the vet clinic. And then went to vet tech school at Purdue, specializing in exotics and wildlife, doing internships at the uh, Wildcat Creek Wildlife Center and the Wildlife Center of Virginia. And, um, then, you know, kept doing wildlife rehab and uh, volunteering at wildlife places, um, worked at zoos and stuff like that, became a, a dog groomer because I really needed an adult job, <laughs> but continued that um, other uh, to keep up my wildlife work because I always knew I either wanted a wildlife rehab facility or uh, some sort of sanctuary with wild for wild animals. And so coming full circle, the facility where I'd raised tiger cubs and monkeys at actually became a sanctuary in 2000. And so becoming a sanctuary, that means you do not buy, sell, breed, trade, or seek out animals to use for entertainment. And so they adopted that as their new policies, that they were only going to rescue animals. And it was because they saw the problem that was become that was coming in the United States, thanks to reality TV and um, people going on talk shows with tiger cubs and bear cubs and leopard cubs and stuff like that. It's a monkey see, monkey do type of thing. And they're like, well, if I see that person, you know, handling one, then I can handle one. I mean, how many times have we seen people mimic Steve Irwin, Jeff Corwin, you know, and people like that um, when on YouTube channels and stuff with snakes and reptiles and getting hurt? What they don't realize is these people have many, many, many more years of experience with these animals than just coming up upon this animal in the wild. And so being uh, doing that education piece and um, talking to people about that and then, you know, now sit, coming full circle and saving their lives and becoming the manager at the facility that I was a high school intern and college, you know, volunteer uh, back, you know, early, late 90s, early 2000s, to be able to see that come full circle was absolutely amazing. And so then with my work there, learning that the most underserved animal in the exotic pet trade is the bear. 
And it just so happens to be my favorite wild animal. So it kind of went, you know, twofold that I was just like, oh my goodness, because they dig, they climb, um, they're strong, their muscles are nine times denser than man's, they are smarter than dogs, they're smart like primates and elephants are, and um, work, if anybody who's ever worked with chimpanzees will understand this, when they go out into a habitat, a new habitat, they test their barriers, so they test, you know, is this platform really sturdy, or can I tear it up? Is this fence really deep and concreted into the ground or can I dig it up? You know, that's the things that they do. Um, and so a lot of people won't house them. A lot of sanctuaries won't house them. There's only a handful of true sanctuaries in the United States that house bears. And even then they're only housing five, maybe 10 tops um, at a time, uh, except for the wild animal sanctuary in um, Colorado. They have a lot, but they have a lot more acreage to be able to house bears on. Um, the only benefit to housing bears is they sleep during the winter. Um, but even then, you know, depending on where they're at, not very long. And then you're back to having them up and them needing a lot of enrichment um, or they destroy things basically. So um, thus the birth of bears, etc. after learning all of this. Like that is incredible. So I didn't realize that bears are the most underserved. So part of my background is I used to work at the Minnesota Zoo and the education department and then also in guest services. And I remember learning all the stories about our bears. Our three grizzlies were rescues from a wildfire up in Alaska and they weren't able to find like their parents so that they had to bring them into a sanctuary because they wouldn't have survived out in the wild, which is why the Minnesota Zoo got them. And then a couple of our black bears, if I remember correctly, were actually people's pets or little cubs that they had thought, oh, this will make a great animal. Why don't I yeah. take it home? And so there's becomes this like you were talking about this difference of is it a sanctuary is it a pseudo sanctuary roadside zoo minnesota zoo you touched on a little bit about explaining how the place you went to was first a roadside zoo and then they made it the transition into a sanctuary is there anything yeah. like governing this to really be like because i see a lot of these places in the news saying like oh we're a sanctuary and i'm like you're letting people hold tiger cubs i don't think you're a sanctuary or a zoo yeah yeah <laughs> No, um, a sanctuary, if they have cubs, that's dollar signs right there. They're using those animals for entertainment as a draw for their facility, if that makes sense. It's different than rescuing a new animal and having people come see it um, because of the interactions. A sanctuary will never allow you interactions with their animals. Um, I mean, they'll allow you to talk to them, you know, or whatever. If you get a behind the scenes tour, maybe use a meat stick to feed someone. But they're not going to, they're, they're not going to bring cubs out for you to pet and play with, not the pay to play. Um, they're not, you know, they're, they're not going to allow that. And so that's one way uh, that you can, and they don't have babies every year. Um, a true sanctuary rarely ever gets baby animals. They usually get them at that teenage phase, depending on the species that's usually three to four or five years of age when the animal is coming becoming an adult and testing their boundaries that they lose control so to speak over this wild animal and really this wild animal is just trying to get away from its parents <laughs> because that's what it's supposed to do right yeah three to five years of age it's supposed to leave its mom and go out and have its new um family of its own, so to speak, find its own mate. It's not supposed to stay with you forever. So a lot of these animals, they're like, leave me alone. <laughs> you know, you've raised me, you've done your job. Now it's time for me to go. Uh, and so then you have a lot of incidents in that nature. The other thing, um, these guys are super strong, you know, just one played with wrong breaks your neck, you know? So that's why, you know, we don't encourage that because then people do want to go out and buy their own animals. So, um, they may be rescuing animals, rescuing <laughs> animals, but they're not a true rescue. Um, I know that, that there's a bear facility up in northern Michigan that rescues bear cubs uh, from other facilities. And if he, so he has bottle babies. And if he kept all of the bears that he rescued, then he would have hundreds of bears. And he doesn't. So that's the other, like, red flag. How many animals do they have? Do you see those cubs every year? 
um, that, you know, s supposedly was raised there last year. Um, but a true sanctuary will rarely ever have babies at their facility. Um, the only babies that I think I've seen in the sanctuary community over the last couple years have been um, tiger cubs dumped at the Mexico, Texas or Mexico, California border. Um, like you said, bear cubs coming in out of the wild that have lost their parents. Um, but otherwise, it's you don't generally see we call the sanctuaries retirement facilities because most of the time they're gonna be older animals and that makes sense and that's honestly kind of the way you would want it right you don't want it to be a bunch of babies coming in because that means someone's out there breeding them you know right. puppy mill style like <laughs> yeah yeah and then you know the the good and the bad of that is that you can house an animal for over 20 years you can give it a good lifelong care you know but at the same time you know 20 to 30 years bears will live over 30 years that's that space right there for 30 years to be able to house these animals um so you need to build more enclosures get more land you know stuff like that as a sanctuary in order to really handle what's coming into the sanctuary community from these roadside attractions so we've talked a little bit about bears, et cetera. We've talked a little bit about the differences between sanctuaries and roadside zoos. So before we get into the gritty topic that everyone's talking about right now of Joe Exotic, I just want to remind everyone watching this that make sure to check out for links in the description below. We'll have links to Bears Etc's website where you guys can go on to help support them and their mission and helping them support and take care of all these different exotics that are coming in from other places. Um, and a true sanctuary, not a roadside zoo, no baby yes. animal holding and petting and pay to play. Um, as well as at the end of this video, once we get through this next stuff that you guys have been asking about, we will be playing a game of wildlife would you rather with Katie. So we're going to see what Katie, as a wildlife uh, person, would say to these kind of funny questions that you guys can ask yourselves and your kids at home. So, Joe Exotic. <laughs> There's been a lot about him in the news. Everyone's talking about this, mostly about the people relationships. Uh, for me personally, I was talking to Katie and I have not actually watched it because I'm not sure if I want to watch it. I don't know if it's something I really want to support with my time or if I'm really interested in watching it at all. Katie, you said you'd watched a couple episodes, but the gist I was getting from everything I've been reading and seeing online is that the show's more about the interactions between the people and the fighting and the rivalry than it is actually about how these animals are being treated and raised. Um, would you like to elaborate a little bit more on maybe some of the conditions and things that weren't covered in the show that people should be really aware of when they're going and supporting someone cool and crazy like Joe Exotic, the tiger crook? I think there's a lot of disappointment uh, across the zoo and sanctuary community because the gentleman that was producing this show started out saying he was going to be the blackfish of roadside zoos. Like that's what he was there and that's what he was interviewing people under the guise of. Um, so he really originally was intending to expose these uh, pay to play places and these interactive places uh, that allow people interactions with this large dangerous carnivores. And so we were so excited to hear about someone wanting to do this for the exotic pet trade. Uh, and then um, when Netflix ended up picking it up and it became this huge train wreck, so to speak, that people can't stop watching. Um, I wanted to be able to watch it just so I could educate myself on what was in it. Um, so that way I could say, no, this is not true. Or yes, this is true. I, like I wanted to be educated myself before moving forward with being able to but I mean the first two episodes said it all it was just um a fight between Carol you know and Joe and really in reality Joe took it as a personal attack because it was his business the cub petting part of it and Carol wants to shut that down we all want to shut that down like we see it as abuse and neglect because scientific studies have shown 
bear cubs pulled from their mom at a couple days of age do experience a type of PTSD from being pulled from their mom and the stress that it causes and the changes in their brain cells that it causes. And so we have science to back up that this is not a good thing for the animals. And when the show made it a fight between the two of them, it's not really a fight at all. It's a, this needs to stop happening. And she has the biggest and loudest voice currently um, to make it her life's mission to close places like this down. Um, and so, but they made it like a fight between the two of them when it, it wasn't personal on the sanctuary side at all. Um, but Joe, because it was his income and it was his facility being um, attacked, I guess, for lack of better terms, um, he took it personal and took it out and then made personal threats on many sanctuary directors um, and many people fighting to pass the Big Cat Public Safety Act. And, you know, threats have been made not only towards Carol, but extremely towards Carol, including videos that he posted from his own YouTube channel of him shooting a mannequin that looked like Carol. Um, it, it's just, it's just awful. And some of the People that have come out of his facility, Doc Antle's facility, Tim Stark's facility, and come forward about the abuse and neglect that's happening there. Um, I met a bobcat at a facility that used to be at Joe's, and they went to Joe's place and found um, these two, a lynx and a bobcat, or two bobcats, I can't remember what they were, and they were starving to death out back because they weren't making any more money for him. And so they took them home. One of them did not survive and one, one ended up thriving. Um, so having experienced firsthand seeing this animal that came from his facility in the before and after pictures, um, seeing the videos of him playing veterinarian um, at his facility, sedated and is sewing up one of his lions, just things like that that have been happening over the last... 20 years at his facility that people don't see. They only see the most recent, the last five years. Um, the other thing people aren't looking at is their USDA inspections. Up until a few years ago, you could go online and look at USDA inspections and see where they're in non-compliance. When a facility is in non-compliance because of animal care and veterinary care, that's a huge red flag. Um, and actually they've, um, I don't know when it's going to be happening, but here shortly they're overturning that. Um, President Trump has already signed it, is my understanding, and that they're putting the USDA inspections back public again. So hopefully we'll be able to use those to educate ourselves what a good facility and what a bad facility is. Um, um, the people coming out of Doc Antle's place just brainwashed um, people coming out of Tim Stark's place, you know, people have a passion for these animals and we see it in the zookeeper community all the time. They're like, they disagree with upper management's, um, decisions on how to care for an animal, but they stay because they worry for the animals. That's how passionate zookeepers are. And it doesn't matter if you have the education and experience behind you or if you're just a person that cares for animals that ends up at a place like Joe Exotics or Tim Starks, you know, or something like that, you have a passion and care for and connect with those animals and you don't want to leave. And it's very hard to get those people to leave and come forward because then they're retaliated against. I mean, Joe's retaliated against many of the people that have come out from his place and stood up against him. So it's very scary on all sides. I can really hear that. There's quite a bit there to talk about. Out of curiosity, did you know why the USDA took off their website, being able to check up on these facilities? Was there a certain bill or something that was being pushed for why they took it down? Uh, the pri uh, personal privacy, because many yeah. of these places are in people's backyards. Mm. Um, so addresses are published and things of that nature. Okay. I guess that kind of makes sense a little bit because 
when I was going through school for my field biology degree, we were kind of, in our zoology class, we talked a little bit about human-animal interactions. So zoonotics is one of those. So it's been fun yes. seeing the coronavirus. But another <laughs> yes. one was on uh, the, the people relationship. So on, we learned about it as a spectrum. On the one end of the spectrum, you have the people who are just like, oh, dumb animals, kill them, eat them, whatever, you know, like the very, very extreme end. And then on the right. other extreme end, you have the people who are like, the alligator is my brother and he lives in my bathtub and he's my best friend. And you're like, right. Trying to find this happy middle. And you're saying you were seeing some of that as far as some of the employees coming out were definitely more for this way. Others were maybe a little bit more reasonably in the middle realizing, Hey, this facility is not doing good things, but I can't do anything because I'm just an employee. Right. And I have, I have friends who've worked at pet stores before who've said the same thing. And yep. My background, uh, me and my fiance, we love lizards. The plan is to eventually have a house where we can do some rescues and do um, fostering of large lizards so that we can move them on to another facility where they can either be an education animal or they can be a good pet. Since a lot of lizards do need a little bit of training, and if they're not handled properly, you get something that's really aggressive and just not an easy animal to work with or to have. Um, and some will just need to be in homes their whole life. But I remember talking with these friends at these pet stores and saying, like, okay, puppy mills, kitty mills, but you got to see what these people are doing with these reptile and other smaller animal mills where they're packing them in these Tupperware and shipping them. And there'll be, like, 30 little baby iguanas, and only, like, 10 or 20 will make it. And then they'll put the nicest-looking ones on display. Right. Like, all yeah. this, this, this whole thing you're talking about, uh, different bills that are being potentially passed to help with some of this. There is a uh, large um, snake, constricting snake act. There is a primate act and there's the big cat public safety act uh, currently um, either at the house or Senate level. I can't, I can't remember um, where each of them are at, but the big cat pay, uh, public safety act did um, pass uh, the initial and went on to the Senate um, this time around. So we're very excited for that. And what that does is it stops the breeding um, of these mutt tigers because that's what they are um, because they've bred them back and forth, different species of tigers together. You know, there's five species of tigers and um, these, uh, roadside attractions are breeding them for conservation and I say con uh, it's not conservation it's conservation c-o-n because it's really is a con because they're like oh there's only 4,000 tigers left in the wild well they're tigers that they're breeding they're not breeding as a part of the SSP the species survival program they're breeding mothers to uh, mothers to um, bro to sons and dads to daughters in order to get these exotic colors of these tigers. Um, so we've got the golden tabbies and the white tigers and the white tigers have all bred and bred down from the same male from the 1950s. And um, it's only that recessive trait is only found in the Bengal tiger. So then they breed these white Bengal tigers to these other larger species of tigers you know, so then they're crossbreeding them and it's just, it's an American mutt tiger. It's just like a dog that you can go to the shelter and get because only one in four tiger cubs are born white if there's that recessive trait, right? If you've taken a genetics class and we get our Punnett squares out, um, that's what happens. And so they're also then born with deformities. Um, they call them, uh, it almost, they almost look Down syndrome-ish, although they still have all of the genetics um, that they're supposed to, whereas, you know, a Down syndrome person has that extra chromosome, but they have the kind of squished face. We have, they have, um, cleft palates. They can't swallow well. Their eyes are crossed. Many of them are blind. Uh, they have seizures. They get cancer at a young, um, age. They generally only live about seven years versus the, the, uh, you know, a true full bred, bred tiger is, you know, 20, 22 years. So, but that's what they've been breeding for for so long in the backyard facilities that they've got all of these mutt, you know, genetic, generic tigers. Yeah. So they aren't going to be able to repopulate. And that's what we want. We want monies to go from the actual zoos to 
saving the um, areas where they truly live and then be able to repopulate them. People might be familiar with like the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums here in the U.S. is kind of like a big one that you look for when you're trying to make sure it's like a certified zoo that you're going to or somewhere else in the world. You'd mentioned another program before to me called the GFSA. Am I remembering it correctly? Uh, GFAS, GFAS, Global okay. Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. So that is similar to your AZA, only it's accrediting true sanctuaries. Um, across the world um, so but they accredit not only exotic animal sanctuaries they horse sanctuaries um, and other sanctuary reptile sanctuaries um, I believe that bat world over in Austin I believe they're a GFAS uh, sanctuary um, for bats that can't be released into the wild um, and things of that nature so they are a very um, uh, very good if you see that on a facility's website they're gonna be a good facility okay that's good to know so now people know they can look for AZA for zoos and GFAS for different sanctuaries whether or not it's right. a place they want to support and whatnot right right um but there, there also are can... other facilities out there that can't mm -hmm. afford to do it at that time or are okay. in transition um both AZA and GFAS have a verification, so to speak. Um, so um, what that means is they're in the process of getting their accreditation. Um, so there th is that as well. And maybe they just haven't gotten that far yet. So while those are good standards of if this place is accredited by this, um, don't use that as the only tool. You know, like I said, look at their USDA standards look at, you know, if they have the babies, look at if, you know, they're letting people go in with their animals. Do they have places to shift the animals out while the enclosure is getting cleaned? You know, are they putting keepers at risk by having full contact, you know, with large dangerous carnivores? So there's different things you can look at um, to say whether this is a facility that I should, you know, give my money to. Yeah, because you'd also talked about the place you had started out volunteering at. They made that transition over from roadside zoo to sanctuary. And so yeah. do you think those are good places to make sure you're helping support too? If they're obviously making that effort to be like, no, we realize we're part of the problem. We want to be a part of the solution. Yep. Yep. It's, it's a huge learning curve. It's a huge education piece. And if anybody ever has any questions, I know you're going to be posting our website and stuff. Feel free to email us use us as a resource um, to know if this you're going on vacation there are these three facilities in the area where you're going on vacation which one of these should I go to or not go to and why you know so we're more than happy to help with that well that's really good to know and yeah a lot of though you've sent me some links and stuff as I was asking questions and getting ready for doing this video to make sure I had the background knowledge that I was ready for it so I'm going to make sure I include all the links to all that stuff that you sent me down below too so for those of you asking more questions so speaking yeah. of the people you talked a lot about how there's this kind of fight between the sanctuaries and roadside zoos it has kind of gotten ugly in the past hasn't it it has you know because we see it we're we're those uh, for the most part, I would say, you know, I speak for ourselves. We're those middle people. The bears that we are about to rescue, the tortoises we have, they are not our siblings. They are not our, well, they are our babies, so to speak. They're not our babies, you know, yeah. that extreme. And we're not, oh, we don't like animals. We have a lot of science behind us. Um, we have a lot of experience behind us. Um, we have a lot of business sense behind us uh, to make sure that we stay in the middle, that yes. not um, holding on to animals for long periods of time, even though they're sick, or we're not spending any money on this animal because it's not monetarily valuable anymore for our facilities. Like we're not, we're not those extremes. We are what's best for the animals and with science and charts and, you know, all of that stuff to give us the best outcome for this animal. This is what we're going to do, whether it costs us a hundred thousand dollars or $5, no matter, like we're going to take care of these animals 
to the best of our abilities uh, for the life of that animal. And we're not going to let it suffer. Um, these other facilities allowing animals at their facilities to suffer because they don't want to spend the money on them. So I've definitely uh, heard of that and seen, a, seen it from other friends before talking about different places. Uh, so for people who want to really help support this, we, they now know how to find the right facilities that they want to support. I'm sure they can probably guess how to best support them, either money or volunteering or helping spread the word about these great places, which is partly why we wanted to have you guys on here. What other things can people do to really help either wild animal populations or the captive exotic animal populations here in the U.S.? Is there any bills or things coming out that people can really try and help push forward for you guys? Yeah, yeah. Um, talk to your elected officials, whether it's your senators, your congressmen, you know, whoever you can talk to about the Big Cat Public Safety Act. Um, talk to them about, look and see what kind of exotic animal laws in your, you have in your area. Are people allowed to have anything and everything that they want to own? Um, where we're at in Texas, Texas has no state laws except for you have to have a permit for a large dangerous carnivore that's not difficult to get um our county um that we live in and the county south of us has much str more stringent laws but the counties northwest and east of us have no laws um so talk to your elected officials about creating some laws um one of the problems that we had up where I was at in Northeast Indiana is Ohio passed a bunch of laws about puppy mills. And then we didn't have any laws where we were at and all of these puppy mill people moved into Northeast Indiana so they could continue to have their puppy mills. Um, so we're going to see the same thing. Um, a lot of people moved out of Ohio with their exotics after Governor Kasich passed had the knee-jerk reaction to pass, nobody can own exotic animals in Ohio anymore. Um, while some of these facilities could have been grandfathered in, um, but that's besides the point. Um, so talk to your elected officials about creating some laws uh, regarding exotic animal ownership, whether it's you know a lion or tiger, or it's a quaddy mundi, whether it's a monkey. Um, the other part of the exotic pet trade, um, we touched on it just briefly, zoonosis, you know, zoonotic disease. Um, we've seen now that a tiger has the coronavirus from a, potentially from a keeper. Um, and it goes both ways. A Kawadi Mundi that I mentioned there in the raccoon family, they can carry a um, round worm called Bayless ascaris that if humans get it, it migrates from their intestines into their brain and drills holes in their brain. Um, and the number of just uh, zoonotic diseases between humans, you know, and other primates alone, there are so many, you know, hepatitis and all of those that can be very dangerous for people. Um, so we're talking, you know, public health when people have these animals and they could be great, nice, sweet animals. Don't bite, don't pinch, no, none of that but they could be carrying something that could harm someone with a suppressed immune system or something of that nature. And you would never know until that person got sick. And then what happens? The animals always lose in the end. And that's the sad part is the animals always lose in the end. So we need to support the facilities, um, support your AZA zoos that are doing a lot, a lot of conservation work, support these facilities that are rescuing, you know, whether a GFAS facility or, you know, a true sanctuary, support them in order to get these animals out of the pet trade, provide them permanent placement where it's going to be safe for the people and the animals. Yeah, exactly. Couldn't have said it any better. So is there any other resources that people should be looking into? I'll include links to them below. I have the list that you sent over to me. Anything else that people should be checking out if they want to learn more about the captive animal trade and industry here in the U.S. as far as uh, large exotics go? Um, I would say most of those links are going to lead you in the right direction. Um, use those facilities as a resource as well. Um, one of the things that I always say, don't just believe me, <laughs> you know, do your own research. I mean, I, uh, I always say that I'm not an expert on this, but I know a lot about it. Um, but please like 
do your own research. I don't want to ever spoon feed people and have them parrot what I'm saying. I want them to know in the depths of themselves, you know, so to speak, that this is true. This is what is happening. Um, so please, and go, you know, do your own research and go down that rabbit trail <laughs> to find out more. Um, because it's so important for you to be able to back yourself up on this stuff when we're going out and we're all fighting the same fight. We need more voices, um, most definitely, to talk to the elected officials, to talk to the USDA. Um, we need more warm bodies to volunteer. We need more, you know, monetary, not just monetary donations, but like for us, you know, with our tortoises, but, you know, fruits and vegetables or, you know, things like that. Some people, um, they may not be able to donate food, but they could make enrichment for an animal to help mentally stimulate it. You know, there's arts and crafts that you can do to help the animals. It's as simple as putting plain Cheerios in a toilet paper roll and, you know, folding the ends and giving them to birds or giving them to, you know, small canids or something like that. Um, your hours uh, volunteering are invaluable, no matter if you can go to a facility and volunteer or if you can be on a social media team across the country and be able to help with their social media. So there's all different types of ways that you can help um, and not be just, you know, a few dollars. I know a lot of people, they apologize. Oh, I can only give $2 or I can only give $5. Everybody, every penny counts when you're a nonprofit, you know, rescue organization, but your hours are definitely invaluable. Well, before we get to our game, was there anything else you wanted to add for bears, etc., that you want to make sure people know before we start playing our game? Right now, we're doing a lot of education. So I'm reading books on Mondays at 10.30, 11 o'clock on our Facebook page. I'm doing a live reading of different kids' books that we enjoy. Um, so come tune in live with us as we read, uh, read those or watch the playback, share them. On Wednesdays, we're doing a virtual classroom. Uh, this Wednesday, we're actually learning about bears. But every Wednesday at 10 o'clock, I'm doing a virtual classroom over Zoom and to teach people about a certain species. So um, we did turtles and tortoises the first week, we did birds last week, and we're doing bears this week. Um, so we'll just keep going with different animals and um, it's half PowerPoint, ha you know, mostly interactive. Um, and then, but the turtles and tortoises and birds we actually did with our animals. So the animals were hanging out with us and stuff as we were talking about them. So that made it helpful. Um, so different things like that. Um, we're going to be starting a backyard bingo game uh, with prizes. So getting people outside in their backyard and finding things that maybe they overlook or have taken for granted. Um, so just uh, stuff like that that we're doing over our Facebook and Instagram that to be watching for and come participate with us. Sounds really awesome. So you ready to play some wildlife would you rather? Yes, I'm so excited. Okay. so. When I worked at the zoo, I was kind of known as the person who kept everyone entertained when we were doing guest service stuff, whether it was with Would You Rather or question games. So for any of you guys watching who know me from outside of Equal Elsa, some of these questions might be a little bit familiar to you. So the first wildlife question is, would you rather have gills or wings? Oh, gosh. I would probably rather have wings. I'm an extrovert, and being confined <laughs> to a lake or you know even the ocean is huge but just the thought of being confined, having wings I could fly anywhere you know I wanted to so that would probably be why I say I'd always pick wings because I like flying but right now especially it'd be real nice to be able to just like fly above everything <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay would you rather have to wear a bear costume the rest of your life or be dressed as Tarzan the rest of your life Oh, I would wear a bear costume. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It gets fun when, uh, you know, Black Friday, you know, the Thursday night before the bear costume, when people are camping out around the best buys and stuff, that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> that sounds like it. I couldn't imagine wearing that down in Texas, though. Like, I went and uh, did a conference down there this past November, and... It was, uh, it was a bit of a shock going from, you know, Minnesota, we're in the 40s, to, oh, look, Texas, here we are in the 70s all of a sudden. Yes. Um, my husband is in our bear costume quite often, and May is kind of the cutoff for events that we can do with Polson, our bear. Um, he did a 5K walking in it um, in 
early May, and that was about the extent of how uh, long he could wear it or he could wear it. So, um, yeah. So during you know the summer, we just try to do like daycares or places that are air conditioned that Polson can go into. So yes, they are very warm down here in the summer. So next question: Would you rather have an elephant the size of a dog or a dog the size of the elephant? <laughs> It's like I, an elephant is much more smart, but I know like how much enrichment my dogs take during the week of like rainy days, and that would be a lot. So maybe the elephant the size of a dog because of the mess and the tearing up of things and the enrichment that is involved with having the dog. We'll keep everything that size. <laughs> Yeah, sounds about right. Okay, so would you rather have to deal with an infestation of spider frogs in your house or bat snakes in your house? Spider frogs. Really? Reason? <laughs> um, I think because we um we leave our door open a lot when it's nice. And so some bugs do come in and out. We don't have a screen door. We just let the dogs run in and out. So the bugs come in and out too. Um, and I like my sleep. So things being nocturnal <laughs> in my house, I, yeah, I would rather have something that's more awake during the day than at night. Would you rather have to fight a giant scorpion or a giant mosquito? I'm allergic to like bee stings and, um, ant bites and scorpion stings, so I would go with the mosquito. <laughs> and last one I made specially for you since your bears, etc. and I wore this today. I forgot to point that out. Yes, your bear shirt. I love it. I love that we wore, well, mine's a little blue. It's showing up a little green. I don't know what color it's showing up there, but. I think it's like, a, it shows up like a cross of blue and green on yours. My yeah. shirt is green. I don't know how it's showing up either. Okay. Would you rather have a bear at your facility that breathes fire or a bear that can fly? <laughs> oh, they are troublemakers. So, yeah. Uh, mm, oh, man. They are huge troublemakers. And they, like, they are sneaky and naughty. So I think I would rather have one that breathes fire than one that can fly and go prank other big <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fire over flying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so for everyone watching today, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed talking with Katie and hearing all the cool things that she does, as well as learning a little bit more about the wildlife sanctuary field and roadside zoos. Um, maybe we can have you on again for any future topics people might be interested in. Yeah, most definitely. I love doing this. So. Okay. Well, sweet. So bring me back. Yeah. So leave in the comments below if there's anything else that you guys would like us to do in a future video and have Katie on to talk more about wildlife. She has a very wide background when it comes to different animal species. She's done the veterinary side. She's done the sanctuary side. Um, so we really appreciated having you here today. For all of everyone who's watching, make sure to check out Bears Etc. and all the links Katie shared with us. Those will be down below as well as make sure if you are interested seeing how you can support her or your other local AZA and sanctuaries. And remember, she said that you can contact her or check out her different tips, links below for how to check and see if it's a facility you wanna be helping out. And lastly, for us here at Eco Elsa, remember we just got our Patreon up, so if you want access to any of our paid classes or things that we are doing, make sure to check that out. Make sure to subscribe down below. And our Etsy is still up with lots of cool animal art and nature art, and as well as some new Kiki stickers and mugs. Our little crested gecko who makes appearances. If you guys want any of that, go ahead and check out our Etsy. So, as always, we hope you guys have a great rest of your week. You be safe. Learn lots, have fun, and get out. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. Bye.